First, I'd like to thank Professor Simon, Professor Sibasic, and everyone else in the organizing committee for making this happen and inviting me. I'm really happy to be here, and thank you for coming. Uh, I hope it's going to be fun and interesting. Uh, so what I, I will tell you about uh, in these four lectures will be about connections between a topic from uh, like quantum antibody physics that we call area laws, and I'll tell you what they are, and quantum information theory. And I, I want to show you how tools from quantum information theory are very useful for analyzing area laws and, and more generally problems in, in many body physics. So just to, to motivate these this connections, uh, let me put some topics, some random topics on, on quantum information on one side and on, on many body physics on the other. So things that we like to study in quantum information theory are, are quantum communication, right? As Graham was telling us, uh, entanglement theory, we like to understand entanglement as a resource. And I don't know, a quantum error correction and fault tolerance and quantum computation and so on. Quantum complexity. So this uh, some of the things that we study in, in our field. Uh, in many body physics, is a huge field, right? There are a lot of different things. So just some, some random keywords here are, for example, we, l we like to understand very ground states, which I'll tell you what they are soon, if you don't know, uh, plus thermal states of some models, right? Or no, many topics, so more recently, like people are studying topological order or exotic matter, uh, spin liquid, so on. So there is also spin glasses, uh, equilibration, all, all kinds of things. And what, what uh, is becoming clear in, in recent years is that, uh, well, that all these topics that we, we study here and the motivations for these future technologies that we hope will come one day, they are actually useful as, as some theoretical framework for analyzing problems in many body physics, but also in thermodynamics or even black hole physics and so on. So for example, quantum error correcting codes turn out to be very related to topological order, uh, quantum computation, quantum complexity to spin glasses, and then on theory to uh, equilibration of quantum systems. And what I want to focus here is a connection between quantum communication and entanglement theory with how we understand and we describe ground states and thermal states of many body models. So this will be this lecture about this connection between these two topics, okay? And we see that this connection appears through the study of these area laws. Uh, okay, so uh, please feel free to interrupt me anytime you want. The more questions, the better. Uh, I'm sure there will be many mistakes on the blackboard, so please just correct me. If you think something is wrong, probably it is wrong, so let me know, please. Uh, so, okay, so uh, I don't have a very clear schedule for the lecture. Let's see how we go. But I, I have a plan for today's lecture. So let me tell you so that you see what, what's coming. So I want to start first uh, introducing or reminding you, I'm sure many of you know this very well already, uh, the concept of bipartite uh, pure state entanglement. And we see that to understand this, we have to understand uh, the quantum entropy. And we will study some properties of it. So Graham already 
told us something about this. I will repeat a few things and tell you a few things more. Uh, then, more generally, I will show you briefly how we quantify correlations. Correlations in quantum states. And then I want to introduce you this concept of area law. Show you, uh, argue why it's an interesting concept, and uh, and in doing so, we will we will learn what are this right first, or remind you what local Hamiltonian is, <laughs> and what are these ground and thermal states, and why we care about them. And hopefully, if I have time, I hope I have. I want to show you the first application of you know, of using things here, in particular, just pr basic properties of entropy and relative entropy to learn something about area loss. I want to show you a proof of area law for any thermal state. And you see it's a very nice, very beautiful proof. Uh, so hopefully we'll cover the case of thermal states today. And what I want to do in the next three lectures is to understand better the case of ground states, of pure states. And this will turn out to be much more challenging than thermal states, but I think it's also more interesting. And you see, we know something about it, but there is a lot of open questions. And hopefully, this lecture will motivate you to work on this, on this area. OK. Is it okay to read? Okay. All right, so Bipartite pure state entanglement. So let's see what it is. So this is really uh, the situation where we understand best entanglement and how to quantify it and everything, pretty much everything we want to know about it. Okay, and it'll be useful because once we define an area law, this will be exactly the sets that we have in mind. So it's good that we understand it very well. So so to define entanglement for for quantum state, we have to consider bipartite or multiparticle quantum states, right? Let's start with some quantum states shared by Alice and Bob, right? So usually we have, we we'll think of picture where we have Alice in here, Bob here, they might be far away from each other, but they should have a quantum state which is correlated. And we, uh, we study here the case when this state is some state psi, okay? So mathematically this is just some unit vector. So the Euclidean norm is one. Uh, sometimes I would denote a bipartite Hilbert space where this guy lives as A tensor B when it's clear from the context what are the dimensions. I will only consider finite dimensional uh, vector spaces throughout my lectures. Uh, you see more about infinite dimensions in Graham's lectures. And when I need to do it explicitly, it will be a complex vector space of dimension DA for Ellis and dimension DB for Bob. Okay. Uh, all right, so so something uh, a very use, useful uh, a state that it tells us a lot about the entanglement of a state psi AP is the reduced state on Alice or on Bob, right? So I'm sure you know this already, but let me define. So the reduced state rho on Alice is just given by the partial trace on Bob of the bipartite state. This partial trace is just with some over some basis for Bob. This is identity on A. OK, I'll denote this by identity always. And then Psi. Psi. So all the, the we care about are measurements is information about Alice. All the information is encoded in this state. Right, and then we can just forget about Bob's part. So we know this is 
a positive semi definite matrix, and the trace is one. It's just a density matrix, right? And, and this, is, this is useful here because if you want to understand uh, entanglement of pure bipartite state in words, we can just say that this entanglement of, of the state psi AB, it's equivalent to the mixedness or to the entropy of rho A. And we could use rho B as well. OK? So it's, it's, it's very simple if you want to understand how much they're entangled. We can just look at, at the entropy, how much mixed rho A is. So one example. Suppose we have an EPR pair. So we have a superposition like that. So this is what we call maximum entangled state of two qubits, right? If you have this, you could, uh, for example, teleport one, one qubit, or you could extract one bit of secret key. So it's a useful resource for doing things. Uh, and we'll and we see later why we can also call this maximum entangled state. But now, OK, so, so this state has a lot of entanglement. And if you look at the reduced state, rho a, what we get? Who knows? Yeah, right? We get the maximum mixed state. So in this case, right, you have a maximum entangled state and you have a state of, of maximum mixedness. OK, so, so this is, I'm telling you this just to, to motivate us to study properties of the quantum entropy, right? So if you want to understand the entanglement here, we have to understand entropy of a quantum state. Uh, and so let me tell you the definition of entropy and some properties. Some of them Graham already told us, so I remind you. So, so we define uh, this notion of quantum entropy. There are many, and you see that we actually will need different notions of quantum entropy later on. But the most, most basic one and, and the most useful one is what we call the von Neumann entropy. And the definition is very, very simple. You all know it's just we look at minus trace lo, uh, rho log rho, or this is the density matrix of this state. Um, OK, so we can also write this as, uh, right? So, so this is a trace. This took the, the a diagonal in the same basis. So it's only a property of the eigenvalues of rho. So we can also write this as lambda i log lambda i, where these guys are the eigenvalues of rho. Um, and always on base 2, OK? Uh, all right. So this is the definition. So why, why this notion of entropy is an is important one? Well, first, because it has many nice properties that I want to show you now. And these properties are useful when you want to prove things about quantum states and quantum information and so on. And also because it has very clear operational meaning. So this is not the topic of this lecture. I will just mention it briefly after I show you the properties. But I guess, well, Graham already told us uh, some operation interpretation. And you see more in Andreas' lectures and, and Pranab's and, and Eric's as well, I think. So OK, so what are these properties? So I'll just state them. I won't prove. I, I think that the tutorials, uh, I would ask you to prove some of them. You see that some of them are very easy. Some of them are more complicated. So the entropy is always positive. That's a good thing. It has to quantify this order. And it's always smaller than log the dimension of, of rho. So rho, I will denote a density matrix by d acting on this vector space, d dimensional complex vector space. So this is some normalization. The entropy is also additive. So if you have two quantum states, that's the product of two quantum states, so two independent quantum states, we just have to sum the entropies. 
that is uh, uh, if we have now a correlated quantum state on, on AB, can be any mixed state on AB, this is always, the entropy is what we call sub-additive. So on tensor problem that is additive, but when we have correlations between A and B, the entropy is always smaller than the entropy of rho A plus entropy of rho B. Okay? Uh, so the entropy is also concave. If we mix states, the disorder, the entropy goes up. So entropy of lambda rho plus one minus lambda sigma is always bigger than the average entropy. Um, so there is one very strong prophecy of the entropy, which is the hardest to prove um, by a mile. It's much harder than the others. And we actually, we, we won't use it in these lectures. But let me just tell you, because uh, I'm telling you almost everything about the entropy, so it's a useful one. It's called strong subadditivity. okay? So it's a strengthening of this subadditivity inequality. It's a property of tripartite states, rho A, B, C. So it says that the entropy of A, C plus the en entropy of rho B, C is always smaller than the entropy of rho A, B, C plus entropy of rho C, okay? So this is something good to know, but we won't use. And now some uh, important properties that we need later uh, that I will write here is continuity. So the entropy is continuous in some nice way, and this will be important later, so let me tell you about this. So this is funniest inequality. And what it says is that, yes? Yes, this is called strong subadditivity. It's, if you just look like that, it, it's something a bit mysterious. It's not clear what, what it means, but it, it's very useful. So one of the reasons why it's very useful, but it's not clear from here, is that uh, this is equivalent to another property that we'll see later, which is monotonicity of the relative entropy under CP maps. And so this is basically a, for, a form of data processing inequality. So this is saying is that if you, if you have two quantum states and you, and you process them, they only can become less distinguishable than they are. From here, it's not clear, but there is a lot of useful things encoded here. This is also useful for defining, oh, is this one or the other one? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I this concavity, right? Oh yeah, so oh, sorry, this lambda is, uh, is just a, a number between zero and one. It's a real number. Rho and sigma are two density matrices. Can be any two density matrices. And it's just, same system. Oh, yes, yeah. same, same dimension. I think yeah. probably the condition is oh, yeah. the higher one, the higher is different system. Yes. Oh, so, uh, in, in right, 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 right. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So, so this is just a sum. Right here was tensor product, here is actually a sum. So let me write. Rho and sigma, they both act on CD, right? So, um, yeah, is it clear? Are, are you sure that, uh, that the inequality is of the right thing? Because if I take C as uh, Here? No, no, the, if I, if I did the, that one and the right, what, one. what Professor Simon is saying is just, suppose you take C to be, to be, to be one dimensional, right? Trivial here. They don't have entropy of A plus entropy of B. Uh, and this is saying that it's bigger than this is zero, right? No, no sorry, no, this is zero, this is zero, and this is entropy of AB, right? And then we recover this one, right? Yes. Oh, yes, this I didn't mention, yes. So there is also this, since I tell you everything, Araklib would be, uh, thank you, yes, entropy of AB is always bigger than entropy of A minus entropy of B. Right, and also, yeah, okay, thank you. All right, so, so this, what is fun is inequality. It, it tells you that the entropy of rho minus entropy of sigma, we wanna see how they deviate in terms of how close these two states are. And it says that it's smaller than, let's define, T as the trace norm difference. I will tell you more about this 
right now, divided by 2. And tells that it's always smaller than t times. Graham already told us this, right? So I'm just writing it again. So suppose rho and sigma, they are both density matrix, the dimensional density matrix, uh, plus binary entropy of t1 minus t. So this is just some function, this h. It's minus x log x minus 1 minus x log 1 minus x. So the important thing is that when x goes to 0, this is some binary entropy, right? So entropy of a probability distribution of two elements. It goes to 0 when x goes to 0, for example. Uh, and this is just saying, right, so when, when c is very small, this is very small, this is very small as well, so the difference of entropies will be small. And so, in other words, this is Lipschitz continuous, and, and the constant is like log dimension. It's the number of qubits. Can you define those symbols right hand symbol of one? Here. Oh, 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 t is this thing. OK? Then log dimension minus 1. Uh, dimension is this one. Bo both states, rho and sigma, they are d-dimensional states. And this h is this function. Is the binary entropy? Ah, oh, and this is just yes, uh, t. <coughs> okay, so yes. So and this is a function of of some uh, parameter between zero and one, and this is the function. Yeah. For the for this inequality, yes. So this is just saying that uh, if this is a measure of distinguishability between the two states, I'll tell you more about this now. If this is small, it means that the two states are close. And by this inequality, this will be small. This will be small as well, because this, goes, this function goes to 0 when x goes to 0. So it means that the two entropies, they are close. Okay. Um, any more question? Yes. Um, that's, the, uh, that's not Euclidean norm, is it? The no, it's trace norm. I'll tell you yeah. right now what it is. It, it's a very, it's a very uh, good measure of distinguishability of quantum states. Uh, okay, so for this trace norm, so for some matrix X, any matrix, doesn't have to be emission not, or anything, the definition is just trace X dagger X, trace square root X dagger X, okay? So I, I, in other words, it's the sum of the absolute value of the singular values of X. So uh, I won't show you now, but I will ask you to, to work it out in the tutorial. One way to write is x is as we maximize over all y for which the infinity norm, the operator norm, is smaller than 1. Okay, So all the singular values are smaller than 1 here. Absolute value of trace x, y. So this is some variational expression for the trace norm. And why this is useful? Well, we can specialize this in the case of quantum states. So suppose, as we do there, we look at the difference of two quantum states, OK? So how, how close they are. And using this expression, OK? So this, again, you work out in the tutorials. This is equal to 2 times maximum of m is a, is a positive semi-definite operator. All the eigenvalues are bigger than 0 and is more than one of trace m rho minus sigma. OK? And, th and this is very useful, right? Because this m, because it's between 0 and 1, is a, what we call a POVM element, right? So it's just a quantum measurement that you can implement. You can always implement a measurement which is composed of m and identity minus m. So this is just telling you that this distinguishability measure is just how well you can distinguish these two states by the best possible quantum measurement, right? Namely, the one that maximizes this expression. So this is really some physical uh, notion of distinguishability between two quantum states. All right. So let me see. 
Okay, I'm going with time. Okay. So, uh, as I said, this is not a unique uh, entropy for quantum systems. It's the most useful one, but it's not a unique. And we need some other notions of entropy. So I, I just I want to introduce one more notion of entropy that will be particularly relevant for yes. Oh yeah, yes. So the infinity norm of y is just equal to uh, the square root of the maximum eigenvalue. Okay, so this is notation maximum eigenvalue of y dagger y. Okay, so it's the maximum singular value of, of y. Uh, all right, so to, to motivate this other notion of entropy that uh, in some sense is the right one for area law, let me just mention our, our operation interpretation of, of the phenomenon entropy, and then we see from there how we end up in the other entropy. I won't give any detail. Graham already uh, gave, you know, mentioned this, and I think you'll see this more later. So this is... Uh, Schumacher compression. So it turns out that this entropy tells us, uh, in, in a particular regime, uh, how many qubits we need to store a copy of the state row. So in the regime is the one where we have many different copies of the state row. Okay. So imagine that we are in a situation where we have n copies of the state row, and it's very large. And we would like, okay, so, so uh, this state some state on, on d dimensions, as usual. But we would like to see if, suppose, you know, we, we, we would need to like uh, log the n qubits to store the state. This we can always do. But can we do better? Can we store the state, or at least a very good approximation of the state in a smaller number of qubits? And this is what this result tells us. It's a very fundamental result. It tells us that. You can do that, and the rate will turn out to be the entropy. So it tells us that there is some physical operation we can do here. This is just a completely positive trace preserving map, okay? Such that we, we transform this, and then here we have some state, I don't know, sigma n. And then there is another decoding operation that we can do, the n, such that, uh, well, actually we don't need this. So we don't need this. So it tells us that there is this, this operation that we can do, uh, so that we map this state to another one. And this operation is, very, is faithful. It's faithful in the sense that this measure that I just introduced, the distinguishability measure, is very small. In particular, when n goes to infinity, it goes to 0. Okay? So in the limits of many copies, this is a very good approximation of the states of n copies of rho. And the important thing is that if you look at the log of the rank of these states, right? So this is the number of qubits that we need to store these states, right? This will be roughly, well, this will be always smaller. There is some epsilon n for which this is always smaller than uh, n times entropy of rho uh, plus epsilon. Okay, and this is for all epsilon you want. So just pick any epsilon bigger than zero, you have this relation. Okay, so it just, just tells you that, well, if you allow for some small accuracy, the, all the information about this state row and copies of it can be encoded in some space of much smaller dimension, depending on the entropy, right? Of dimension, of number of qubits growing like n times the entropy. Okay, and there is the converse, which tells us that we cannot do better than that. So really, if you try to compress to n dimension smaller than, than roughly this one, then it's a terrible approximation to the state. Yes? Is any parameter you choose? So, I add this, sorry, no, this is a, is a, is a physical operation. So, mathematically, it's a trace preserving, completely positive map. So, I think you see this later, I, I don't want to define it now, but you can just think of some physical operation, something that you can implement in nature. So you just say that there exists some physical operation that you can implement that compress the information down to the, to the entropy, basically. Okay? 
So I won't show you how it works. It's, it's not difficult, and I think you might see it later. So what I, what I, why I'm showing you this? Well, because this first gives some nice interpretation for the entropy, but also motivates another definition of entropy that we're going to use. And this is the one where we don't want to study the limits of many copies, right? Suppose you just have one copy of the state, row, and we want to understand what we can do with it, right? For example, we want to understand how many qubits we need to store the state row. Uh, and, and while this, you know, for the entropy, it's a beautiful theorem, like this one. For the case of one copy, is, is a pretty boring definition, but, you know, sometimes it's what we have to use. So let me tell you what it is. Uh, uh, I, I, yes, I'm telling you that when you have many copies, uh, the theory is much simpler than when you have one copy, right? In particular, uh, you have this nice entropy, uh, nice function that tells you how, how much space you need, the entropy. In the case of one copy, you have something similar, but you see what it is. It's, it's log of the rank, basically, right? So it's not very interesting. So this is what we call the max entropy. We denote by S max. And it's just, you know, log the rank of rule. Okay? So obviously, it's how many qubits, at least, uh, you know, up to rounding up, that you need to store one copy of rule. But it, right, it's, it's just a definition, <laughs> not more than a definition. But it, sometimes it's what we have to use, and you will see this more clearly tomorrow. Okay. So this is a very, you know, the entropy had all these nice properties. This is a much more rigid object, doesn't have all these nice properties. In particular, it's very bad, badly uh, non-continuous, right? Because the rank of the state. So we can add some very small perturbation, as small as you, went, as you want, and change the rank by an arbitrary amount. So this is something bad, right? This is not something very physical. So this motivates the definition of some smoothing of this guy, which we call smooth. Max entropy. And this will be very useful for us later. And and this guy is with the S max epsilon. It's a function of some error parameter on the state row. And what it is, well, you just minimize over all states sigma, which are in an epsilon ball around rho, I'll just define what this is, and the S max of sigma, okay? So this, we just look, is the set of all states for which this trace norm difference that we just saw to, of rho and sigma is smaller than epsilon, okay? So are, are all the set of states which are epsilon close to rho, and then here, what we are saying, well, we want to see how many qubits we need to store rho, but not rho exactly, but just some approximation of rho. And this epsilon is the approximation level that we allow, right? The, the bigger the arrow that we allow, the smaller the number of qubits that we might need, okay? And this is this function. Um, so one way to, to prove uh, Schumacher's compression theorem is just to say that if we evaluate this S max epsilon on n copies of rho, and we divide by n, for any epsilon, in the limit, this converges to the entropy. And that's indeed true, but we, we won't see this now. Any question on, on this? OK. Uh, I, I won't, but other people will in the other lectures. And since we're not going to need it, I, uh, and I'm happy to, to explain you after the, the lecture. But basically, it's a measurement. You make a quantum measurement with very high probability you get a particular uh, outcome, and then you just project to this guy. In the other case, and then the dimension is very small. In the other case, you get something bad, but this only happens with very small probabilities. Okay? But, uh, and for, for those of you who know, this is the project onto the typical subspace of rho. Uh, but we won't, we won't need this in these lectures. So I, I explain you that just that to motivate this measure. This would be an important measure for us. Okay. So, uh, so 
So I told you all that because we want to understand entanglement, right, in pure states. Um, so let's go back to entanglement. And then we, we can now define a measure of entanglement, which is a very good one, uh, which we call entanglement entropy. It's a measure for bipartite quantum states. And it's equal to uh, the entropy of rho A. And this entropy is always equal to the entropy of rho B. This we also, you will also show in the afternoon. OK? Um, so this is the definition as a measure of entanglement. Why it's a very useful measure of entanglement has a very clear, again, operation interpretation. And this will be the topic of Eric's lectures. He will explain you this very well. Uh, so let me just mention it now, and you'll see this later. So the interpretation, as in Schumacher, is suppose we have Alice and Bob, and they are separated, they are far away from each other, okay, and, but they share some entangled states. Psi, and again, right, entropies, uh, like this, uh, entro uh, for normal entropies, they will always be associated to many copies. So here we assume that we have many, many copies of these states, the same state on AB. And I'll suppose Alice and Bob, they're two experimentalists, but they are very far away from each other. They are separated. And they cannot send quantum particles. They, cannot, they don't, cannot send photons or anything. So all they can do is communicate with each other on a, on a classical telephone line. Okay? They can talk to each other, but they can only communicate classically. So then if you look at the class of physical operations they can implement, this is what we call uh, LOCC. This is local operations, local quantum operations. So locally, they can do anything that quantum theory allows, uh, plus classical communication. OK? So suppose they have many copies of these states, and they have access only to this class of operations to manipulate it. So this consists of Alice makes a measurement, whatever she wants, gets some outcome, communicate to Bob, Bob makes a measurement, gets an outcome, communicate to Alice, and they continue as long as they wish. Uh, then there is a very nice uh, theorem about, about this, uh, this problem. Uh, which tells us that in this situation, suppose we have n copies of psi, then we apply some LOCC protocol, just some physical operation of this form. And then we can get We can go back as well. So, and the number of copies is approximately these two. Uh, so, okay. So this is just a teaser for what uh, Eric will tell you. So this just tells you that if you care about the, so from n copies of psi, we do this operation, this physical operation, we get n times the amount of entanglement in psi copies of the EPR pair that we saw before where it is. And we can go back as well and recover the n copies of psi in the limit of many copies with vanishing error. OK, so it means that really, and we could put any state that we want here, right? So from this, we can start from, uh, we, uh, for example, if we just put any other state phi, the same is true. But we have the ratio of the amount of entanglement. And so this is basically saying that there is only one parameter that we care about in this setting, namely the entropy of entanglement. This tells us everything, right? In the sense that, you know, uh, if you have access to LOCC and you want to manipulate entanglement, you knowing this parameter, you know this parameter, you know exactly uh, what are the rates of transforming one state into another that, that we need. OK? Uh, yes? Yeah, yeah so, so this is a class of quantum operations. So this will be the topic of Eric's lecture next week. OK, so uh, you understand much better next week. But this consists of 
a class of local quantum operations. So local meaning Alice can do whatever she wants here, allowed by quantum mechanics. Unitaries, tracing out, adding ancillas. Bob as well. But they can only communicate classical information. So they can only send bits to each other. They cannot send a quantum particle, for example. Okay? So this is a situation where we have two parts which are far away, which is where entanglement emerges. Two particles are far away, but quantum communication is very expensive, so they can only use classical communication. And then entanglement is a resource. For example, with classical communication and entanglement, you can do teleportation and, and implement any operation you want, but you want to understand how you can manipulate this resource. Okay? And then you have just one number, which is good. I, yes? And copies of psi, yes. Yeah, by this, I just mean that you apply some LOCC uh, quantum operation to n copies of psi to get this number of copies of phi plus. Ah, no, yeah, this approximation means that in the limit, they become equal, but you know, the trace normal difference, uh, difference is small and goes to zero. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's right. It's not the same operation, but it's reversing the process. Again, there is some errors. Again, uh, it's some deviation for which when n goes to infinity, the trace norm difference goes to zero. Okay? And we know how it goes. It's like basically 2 to the minus order square root of n. But it's, yes. From here to here? Ah, here. Yeah. Oh, I just mean write the same thing, but replacing this guy by this one. So yeah, you can go from psi to any state you want, but the number of copies is different. The number of copies is given by the ratio of the amount of entanglement psi to the amount of entanglement to phi. Okay, so if this is much bigger than this, then of course you can get more copies, right? Because this was more entangled initially, and the other way around. And you can also go back. So, again, next week this will be much more clear. Yeah. 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 So, um, marginally related. So, I, it's it's related in the sense only in the sense of that. Uh, when you have many copies, many things get simpler, right? So in the case of, of mean field, it's more like that uh, if you have many copies and you look at some, at, at some reduce, uh, some partial trace, all the entanglement uh, is not relevant. So you can just approximate by some separable state and therefore product state. Here is not this what's going on, but it, it's, it's similar in the sense that when you, ha when you have many you know, uh, limits of large n, you expect things to, to become more regular and to simplify it. It's basic of law of large numbers here. From from Schumacher compression theorem, you can prove this. Okay, it's it's not anything. It's nothing hard, but it's very it's very interesting. Okay, so this is all I want to talk about pure state entanglement, and I'm telling you this just to motivate why we're going to study this later in the context of area loss. For area loss, we we also need, um, but maybe, okay, let's just do this briefly. So I, we also need. Uh, 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 some way of quantifying not entanglement in pure states, but correlations in okay, arbitrary. So, so this will be correlations in in bipartite quantum states. So how we quantify these correlations using something that we call a mutual information. Graham also already defined this for us. Let me remind you. The, the mutual matrix information on C, D, A, tensor, complex vector field of DP dimensions. And the definition is we look at entropy of A plus entropy of B minus entropy of AB. Okay? Uh, so this is the definition. So... Uh, 
Again, this has an operation interpretation. I won't get into that now. But actually, in, in two lectures, we're going to see this operation interpretation because it's going to be useful to prove what you want to prove. Uh, but for now, let uh, me just. Oh, before another definition, some, uh, another measure of distinguishability that we're going to use later. This is what we call the relative entropy. It's a function of two states in the same vector space, two density matrices. And the definition is, you look at trace rho, log rho minus log sigma. OK? Uh, so this, this is, again, a measure of distinguishability. The closer these two states are, the smaller the relative entropy. It's it's a very important information theoretical quantity. Uh, I could give a, a whole course about this, right? It's something very useful in quantum information. But for now, I'm introducing this because we can write the mutual information of AB as a relative entropy between rho AB and the reduced states, rho A tends to rho B. OK? And, and this is really the way to prove all the properties that I'm going to tell you now. So we know many properties of, about this. Some of, the, of those we, we will see in the afternoon, how to prove. Uh, but then this implies first that the mutual information is always positive. OK, good. All right, makes sense. It's a measure of correlations. We cannot have negative correlations. There is also some normalization that is good to know. This is always smaller than twice the minimum of dimension of A dimension of B. And the final property that is also useful is what we call a Pinsker inequality. This tells us that this mutual information is always bigger than some constant, 2LN2, and the trace norm difference of rho AB to the reductions. And then from here, you can already see that this should be a measure of correlations, right? Because this is a clear measure of correlations. If they state rho AB is product, there is no correlations, and this is zero. If they state rho AB is not product, the states are different, and the trace norm is faithful, so it's always different from zero. So this is a measure of correlations. And this is telling that this other measure is always bigger than this one, up to some constant, right? So, so whenever the state is not product, this is non-zero. And when the state is product, this is zero as well, right? This is easy to see because this guy will give zero, right? When it's the, you can just verify this, OK? So it's, it's a much deeper measure. There are other, um, much more theory around it, and we'll see later. But for now, I, I just want to show you that. OK, and, and this was just some intro to, to part of the information theory that we're going to, to use. Now let me finally go to area law, right? What it is, and uh, please. Uh, uh, and oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. So I mean, for this to make sense, right? The support of rho should be contained in the support of sigma. Otherwise, this diverges. This is infinity, right? Um, a, a, yes. Yes. It's the same, yes. Yes. This is, is this is good to verify as well, right? Just to prove what I wrote here using the definition. Uh, ah, yeah, good point, yes. But, uh, you know, it usually it's not symmetric. But in this particular case, well, I, I mean, this, this is not symmetric in the arguments. This is only, the mutual information is symmetric only on A and B, right? But of course, if you reverse the arguments, yes. you don't get the mutual information anymore. Right. If you look at the relative entropy of this guy, no, at uh, this one. This is not the mutual information anymore. You don't get it. Yeah. Uh, any other question before we move on to, to area law? Yes. It will be, sorry? Uh, yeah. Uh, right. 
That, that's true. Yes. Oh, yeah. This is always well defined. That's right. Exactly. Yes. Right. So, so this always holds true for in this case, right? Again, it's a good exercise if you want to think about it. It's why it's the case. Uh, right. So, what is area law? Area law is a property of a particular quantum state. It's a property that might hold and might not hold. And there are interesting situations where it holds true. Okay? And when it holds true, we can say interesting things about the states. Uh, but I'll get to that later. So, so just the definition. Suppose we have a quantum state. And to define area law, we need to consider quantum state defined on a particular lattice. Okay? It can be on a line. And the line will be the case we're going to focus later on, because it's where we understand well this problem. It can be in a square. We don't understand it very well already on a, on a you know, cubic lattice and so on. So imagine we have a state which consists of qubits or qubits for simplicity and n of them. Okay, so we have a multiparticle state. And suppose that the particles are arranged on, on a square here, for example. So these are the particles of the state. Right and so on. Okay? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's right. So you change the definition of extensivity? So uh, that's right. So uh, when an area law holds true, we don't have extensivity of entropy. So it'll be in a very particular situation of the entropy, right? That we, uh, but, but on the other hand, we will see that in some cases, like ground states of, of many body Hamiltonians, this is the case. So it tells us something interesting about entanglement that we wouldn't expect from extensivity of entropy, for example. Uh, all right, so, so first, uh, I'm not giving you references. Uh, uh, tomorrow, I'll try to give you more. Uh, I forgot today. So there's a nice review on area law. That's the archive number. You know, it's a bit old, so many of the things I'll tell you now, uh, they're newer than this. But it's very good for motivation of the problem and what's, what's known. Um, OK, so if you want, you can check there. So, so what's the definition? Suppose the definition is the following. We just choose any region we want here, a connected region, OK? And we call this x. And, and the complement, I will call x bar, OK? It's in some convention. And now, um, what's the definition? Uh, we say that psi. Satisfies area law uh, if we can find some constant, so there exists some positive constant such that uh, for all regions x, okay, it doesn't matter how we choose x as long as it's connected, the following holds true: the entanglement entropy of psi x with the complement. Okay, so this is the amount of entanglement of x with the rest of the lattice. This we know, we just saw, right? This is equal to the amount of entropy in the region x. And this should be smaller than some constant, this constant, times the area of x or the perimeter of x. Okay, so this, this is the area of a region x, is like this. And this will be this, the size of the area. So this is equal to the perimeter. of x. OK, so in this case, it's, it's just this length, right? OK, I uh, guess. Yes, so, um, uh, so we have a uh, area law holds if the fall is true. We choose any region we want, namely this one in this case. And, and then we ask how. Uh, how much entropy this region has, or how, how much entangled this region is. And then area law holds true if this amount of entanglement here is always smaller than the perimeter of the region, the boundary of the region, times some constant. That doesn't matter, some universal constant. Okay? So why, why this is interesting? Because we just saw right, that the entropy of x is always smaller than uh, the log 
the dimension of x, so the number of qubits in the region x. And for many states, in fact, you see later from most states, if you take from you know, the, the Haar measure, they saturate this pretty closely to maximum. So it says that, and related to extensivity again, it says that we expect that for, you know, for a typical quantum state, the amount of entanglement here or the amount of entropy will grow with the volume of x, right? With the number of particles in high side here. Area law is saying that this is not true. It doesn't grow. If our area law holds true, we have to see when it holds, when it doesn't. It's saying that we have much less entanglement than, than the maximum case and the, the typical case, actually. It's saying that the amount of entanglement is not the volume, but it's just the area, right? In a sense, you know, another way of seeing this is saying that the entanglement is local, right? That particles here, here, they might be entangled only with the nearby particles, right? So, of course, this doesn't contribute to the entanglement between here and here. Only the particles on the boundary would contribute to the entanglement, and therefore we have something proportional to the boundary, right? So this is some intuition that we see in the context of Hamiltonians why this might be true, and you see that is uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the work we are going to do in the next lecture is to try to make this uh, intuition to make sense, and we see it's very tricky, but we see that it's it's you know it's an interesting thing to think about. Yes. So suppose uh, suppose x complement is null. Yes. Okay. Then you get an equality. Oh yeah, yeah. Then then in this case it's not interesting, right? Because it's a pure state overall, so it's zero the entropy, oh, yeah. right? If it's everything. Yeah. Uh, okay. So this area law for pure states. Oh yes. Yes. Can I define this? Because then it will depend on the surface area of the point. That's right. You, you can define, yeah, definitely. This works in any geometry. You, you can define in any geometry you want. In any dimension. In any dimension you want, yes. As you see, unfortunately, we only understand this well in one dimension. It's a challenge to go to higher dimensions, but I have to tell you what, what we know and what we don't. Yeah. So I, I, well, it depends on how, how you see it, right? But on, I think on one hand it's surprising because uh, if you just take a, a, if you look at all possible quantum states on n particles, then you can prove, and actually we're going to see this later, that most of them have the prop property that the entropy here is proportional to the volume, okay? So this tells us that states which satisfies area law, they are exception. There is only a very small fraction of them that satisfies area law. It's not the typical case. What's interesting is that this exception is very well motivated because states that we care about in nature, physical states, will turn out to satisfy area law in many cases. And Black holes have a surface area. That's right. Yes, this I will, yes, this is what I will mention. Yes, please, Sivasai. Uh, independent of the C, I, E, uh, no, okay, so, so C should be a constant that might depend on the number of particles, for example, but nothing else, right? It cannot depend on the region X. Uh, no, it should be independent of the sets, can only depend on, on n. And we'll see later, you know, we, we, they said we have some properties, for example, correlation length. We'll see that c will be a function of the correlation length only, nothing else, or the gap of the Hamiltonian and so on, but we'll get to that. Uh, yes? A state, uh, you mean a particle or a state? A particle, yes. Like, like here, you say, for example. Or here. Uh huh. Ah, uh, here, yeah. Uh -huh. It will be less correlated with uh, some particle from X prime to X power. Uh, it, it depends, right? So, of course, in general, no, because you could have an EPR pair here. So, so then this case is a problem. But we will see that in states that we care about, like ground states, for example, Femitonian, what you said is true. Typically, a particle here will only be correlated with something around and not with something here. That's right. It will be, we will define this now, Hamiltonians of, of you know, uh, like local Hamiltonians. Yes? Oh, it's just, it's, just, it's just the length of this curve here, for example. No, okay, the number of qubits that, that it's inside, this is the volume, right? Uh, what metric? Um, Euclidean. Yeah. 
Yes. Oh, it's a good question because it does. I, you know, I, I, I'm being uh, non precise because usually area law will make sense when we have a regular lattice, like a square or, or a cube. And then the, these metrics, no, they are all equivalent, right? But you could study this in, in like in some more, uh, more uh, complex graph. And then it, it will matter which metric you use. But then we don't expect area law to hold true. So that's why we usually, you know, yeah, just think of Euclidean, Euclidean distance. Um, Okay. So okay, so translation variance might help us, but we won't need it. So regular, uh, yeah, regular lattice, yes, yes, yes. So I, I I won't tell you anything about black holes because I don't know. Zbazich might tell you if you want. Uh, what what I, the only thing that I want to tell you about black hole and. And this would be now, right? Uh, is that this is where this story started? Okay, the beginning of the first uh, people to look at area law was people interested in thermodynamics of black holes, right? What what they observed is that if you take a black hole, you look at the entropy of the black hole. This was proportional to the area of the black hole, okay? And then this was something surprising. Then there has been a lot of development, right? So this is like some some uh, uh, some manifestation of what people call holographic principle, right? That you know you have you have some physical theory on the bulk. You can get some theory of, on the boundary. We describe the physics of the bulk. There are many things like nowadays ADS, CFT, and a whole industry doing that. Unfortunately, I don't know anything about this. But interesting things up. You know, when when you have a deep concept in one area of physics, it pops up in a different area, right? And you see again that in in a much simpler context of just many body physics, no relativistic quantum mechanics on the lattice. Again, this concept of area law will appear, and it will be relevant. Okay, so uh, if you know more about, about this problem, the context of black holes, I, I would like to. You can teach me, but I I cannot say anything. But I don't know. Yes. One one particle in the bulk. Well, it's not zero. Then, the, then the area is like the volume, right? So it's it's one, right? The minimum area will be like okay, definition. But the minimum area for me will be one. Then this is trivial, right? Because this C can be big enough. Yeah. But right, yes, it depends how you define the area. Right, because it's definitely not true. We don't want to have a definition for which what you said is true, right? We, a single particle, it might contain entropy, right? In fact, it might contain a lot of entropy. We don't care about single particle. We care about when you have a region which is Big enough. In asymptotic in what what way? In, in the number of uh, uh, yes, typically. Then, yeah. Yes, yes, we we care about area law when n is very big. So yeah. All right. Right. So one motivation I just mentioned. Let me just write, but. I said everything I want to say. Is this concept comes from black uh, black hole physics and holography, but, but relevant to this course is that in you know in describe the state classically. Okay, if an area law holds true, then first it tells us that we don't have a lot of entanglement, right? Entanglement is much less than what it could be. But it also tells us even more. It tells us that we can write the state as a, we have a good classical ansatz for the state. Okay, we can write it in some representation. And I'll show you in one dimension what it is. And this, using this representation, you can study properties of the state. You can compute local expectation values, correlation functions, etc. <coughs> so, so this is a good news if you want to simulate quantum systems. Right? Whenever you have an area law, this, there's expectation that this leads to good ways to simulate a quantum system. Yeah, so uh, here. So, so you have your particles. And then the boundary is just constant, right? The boundary is just this. So in this case, the, uh, the area holds true if the amount of entanglement here is always smaller than a constant. It's independent of the size of the region. Okay? And you see that this happens. So right in the sense, area law is much uh, is much stronger in one dimension than in large dimensions, right? Which is one of the reasons why we understand better in one dimension. In one dimension, it really just tells you that 
doesn't matter the cuts, you have a constant amount of entanglements. And, and of course, this has to restrict the state a lot. All right. So we want to understand area law in the context of many body systems. And to do that, we have to, uh, just, let me just see how time. Uh, we have to see what, what are the kind of states that we care about, right, in this context. And these states, usually, they will come from what we call local Hamiltonians. So a local Hamiltonian, so Hamiltonian you all know is just some Hamiltonian matrix, right? So again, it will be Hamiltonian on, on spin, spins, so on, on this kind of vector space. We could consider Hamiltonians on like fermions and or bosonic uh, systems, and we can study area law in the systems. It's interesting, people have done, but I will focus on, on finite dimensional uh, Hilbert spaces. So here, Hamilton is just a sum of local terms, okay? So, so this is, uh, let me define on, on a line first, and then you see it's simpler. So imagine that we have particles on a line like this. N particles, and then we define a Hamiltonian like this, where uh, this term H K K plus one only acts non-trivially on the qubits K and K plus one. Okay, so this is like K, this is K plus one, and here we have this interaction term H K K plus one. Okay, so w it's a sum of local terms. So one term only acts here. This is H uh, one two. Then this is H23 and so on. Okay, so this is well. This is what I expect from physics, right? So you know, uh, interaction nature they are sh usually short range and only involve a few bodies. So we should have something like this. This is nearest neighbor. It might be next nearest neighbor, but the important thing, more generally, what we want is just a Hamiltonian for which all the terms involve only particles which are nearby. Okay, so of course you know you could do in large dimensions. And you can have a Hamiltonian where the local terms one involve these particles and then these ones and these ones. But this should be small regions, right? Only involving like you know, 10 neighbors or 20 neighbors, doesn't matter. Okay? And then we, we have a notion of locality here, right? So it's a, it's a local Hamiltonian. And then we expect this locality on the Hamiltonian to manifest itself in properties of the system, right? And this is what we are going to see. Uh, okay, so. Just for concreteness, some examples that you might know. One is Ising model, right? What's the Ising model? Well, it's we have some constant J. You have some over poly matrix Z on nearest neighbors, right? So uh, let me write like this. This means that i and j are near, uh, near neighbors, right? On a line, it's just this. On a square, would be this with this, this with this, right? <coughs> and we can have some magnetic field if you want, right? Okay, this is one thing. This is one model, very popular. Uh, we understand well area law here, for example, although I, I don't want to consider specific models. We have like x, y model as well. We have many, right? So this is like, <laughs> Uh, the Hamiltonian is some constant times sum of i xi xj plus y i yj, where y again is the Pauli y matrix, okay, and so on. And really, uh, you know, condensed matter physics is about taking the Hamiltonian and understanding its properties, in particular at very low temperatures, right? So we know, like. Uh, uh, well, we see, you see, well, before I get to that, let me just, uh, yes. Is it's over uh, neighbors. Uh, okay. Um, Right, so given a Hamiltonian, what are the things we want to understand about it? There are many things we want to understand. Here we want to focus on, on for example, the ground state of the Hamiltonian. So what are they? Well, we have a Hamiltonian. It's a Hermitian matrix. 
So it has, uh, you know, it has uh, real eigenvalues and the associated eigenvectors. We are interested in the eigenvector, psi zero, associated to the minimum eigenvalue. Okay. So the eigenvalues are just the energies of the model, right? So this is the minimum energy or the ground energy, and this is the ground state. So the ground state is just the eigenvector associated to the minimum eigenvalue, to the minimum energy. And, and a large part of you know, many body physics is really looking at interesting Hamiltonians that describe interesting physics, look at the ground state and study its properties, right? So, so some famous examples that, that you might know or have heard of, of ground states and they were useful in understanding physics like, you know, in BCS theory, theory of superconductivity, they, they got the Nobel Prize, but in Cooper and Schiffer by really writing, the, consider the Hamiltonian for superconductivity and look at the ground state and find a good ansatz for the ground state, right? Understanding properties of this ground state. Or, I don't know, you look at a fractional quantum Hall effect, the same thing, right? It was about to understand this physics of electrons in two dimensions. Uh, in this case, they don't even know the Hamiltonian, but they could get a very, a very good ansatz for the ground state again. And then using this ground state, they can understand what's going on. And so on. So, uh, so you know, uh, yes. Huh? Yes, very good, yes. One I signed condensate, right, and so on. There, there are a lot of things. Now, uh, okay, so this is object we want to understand, but then we are faced with, right, this curse of, of the Hilbert space, right? So if this is on n particles, the dimension is two to the n. Is, so the dimension of these states is exponentially big in the number of particles, right? So this, uh, you know, this is some barrier that we have to face when you want to understand the systems. It's very, it's very good news for us when you want to when you want to study quantum computation, or you know, because it gives it potentially gives a lot of power to quantum systems. But it's a problem when you want to actually, you know, with our class computer, or with our hands, right down these states, right? And this is one of the motivations for area law. So. Yes. That's right. Yeah. So there is a difference in the structure of entanglement. Yeah. That's true. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's that's an important point, right? So many times to understand what's going on, we don't have to know exactly the whole state. It's enough to know some properties of the state, right? And it depends on the on what you want to understand. We have to figure out what's relevant about the state. And uh, um, okay, uh, so another state that we are also considering, and we see uh, area laws are much simpler for them, as I already told you, are thermal states. Okay. So, so the reason why ground states are used in many cases is that if you have very low temperature. We expect the system, right, to go to the minimum energy and therefore to go to the ground state. Uh, it's not always the case, but you know, in many situations, it's a good approximation. So thermal states are different. Now we imagine that we have this Hamiltonian and it's coupled to some heat bath, and we have finite temperature. Then we expect that we don't go to the ground state, but we go to the thermal state, right, to the Gibbs state. So the definition of the Gibbs state at temperature T is e to the minus h. Boltzmann constant T of a trace of this guy. This is, right, this is the partition function. So uh, later on, I'll, I'll set this to one now just to simplify. So Boltzmann constant will be one. This is the equilibrium state of, yeah. So imagine you have here, you have the Hamiltonian and you have Beth here. And these guys are coupled weakly. And then you look at the equilibrium configuration, and then the reduced state here will be this one. Right? So we are not considering the environment here, but only the state of the system, and it will be described by this Gibbs state when it equilibrates. Okay. Uh, so, so now our goal is to understand when area law holds true in these two cases. Uh, and um, okay, so. Uh, 
so as you see, it's pretty general in this case. Here, it, it appears it depends crucially on another, another parameter of the Hamiltonian. Okay? And this is the spectral gap. So we will consider a class of Hamiltonians, of models that we call gaps. So gap models. Um, so what's the definition? So first, we define the spectral gap. Ah, so, so to define the gap, and in many cases, we, you can consider fixed Hamiltonian on n particles, but usually we think about some family of Hamiltonians with growing number of particles, right? So we think of, of some family of Hamiltonians for which hn contains n particles and you know, they, and they grow. And then we can define a spectral gap for this family of Hamiltonians. This is just the first excited energy of, H, of hn minus the ground state energy of hn, okay? So we have the minimum energy, minimum energy here, E0. Then we look at the next energy, E1. Of course, these two might change when we change the number of particles of the model. We want that this doesn't shrink. We want that, ah, let finish. Uh, so we say that hn is gapped. If there exists some constant bigger than zero for which this delta n is bigger than delta for all n, okay? So it's exactly the situation. We have these two energies. They might vary with n, but they're always separated by some constant delta independent of n, okay? So uh, one thing that we know from physics is that for this class of models, gap models, uh, we can call them non-critical models, right? They usually this happens, then the properties of the ground state are, are much simpler. This is when you are far away from a, a quantum phase transition, for example. Uh, so you see later that correlations decay very fast in these states, uh, and so on. And this will also be the Hamiltonians, or at least <laughs> one kind of Hamiltonians for which you expect area law to hold true. So what's, what's, our, um, what's our physical intuition about area law? Or better physical expectation? Uh, so we expect two things. First, when temperature is zero, we expect that for gapped models, so models you know, where you have this energy separation, this is equivalent to the ground state having area law. Uh, okay, so uh, it might be degenerate. But then to the rest of the spectrum, you have a gap. Who has the, uh, yes. So yeah, okay, so this, I'm, I'm simplifying here to the case of unique ground states, but even when you have degenerate ground states, as long as you have some states here and then a gap to the rest, we also expect area law. And we see in one dimension, we can improve that. Uh, for critical models, these are models where the gap shrinks, right? Where this, you know, they become smaller and smaller. The expectation, and this is based on, on you know, early examples that people could work out and on some physical intuition that I'll tell you later. We expect to have an area law, but uh, with a logarithmic correction log correction. What's this? This just says that the entropy is smaller than the perimeter, the area, times log of the perimeter, okay, in some constants. All right, so it's a, it's a deviation of area law, but it will still be, the entropy is much smaller than it could be. Okay, for uh, temperature bigger than zero, Oh, I didn't define uh, area law for temperature being for mixed states, but I can just do it now. So it's the same thing. You have a state, but now a mixed state. And there are many ways to define, but uh, at least for now, I want to define as there is an area law if the mutual information, entropy is not a good measure, right? Because the state is mixed now. So we want to look at the correlation between this region. So the mutual information between x and x complement this will be smaller than uh, 
constant times the perimeter of the region X. Okay? Exactly the same thing as for the pure state case, but now we cannot use entropy of X, we have to use mutual information between X and X complement. That's correct, yes. Of course, you can say, well, maybe we're interested in area law for entanglement, right? And then we can use some measure of entanglement. And we can do that, it's interesting. But if we have an area law for this one, then for many entanglement measures, we have an area law as well, right? Because many entanglement measures are smaller than the mutual information, which is like the total amount of correlation. So like, if you know these measures, and the syllable entanglement will be example. If you have an area law for this, you have for the syllable entanglement or squash entanglement, relative entropy of entanglement, so on. Not for all of them, like entanglement formation doesn't, is not smaller than this, but for many of them. Okay, uh, so again here what we expect, area law to, to always hold. So always area law. And I'm, uh, okay, I should, uh, okay. I have five minutes? Or? Or less. It's five. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. So this is what we expect, right? So uh, as you see later, uh, we will just see that this is a case where we can actually prove it's true. Uh, it will be the next result. Okay. For 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 at least this mutual information. Yes, it's independent of any other properties. It's just a property of the temperature. Okay, as long as the temperature is finite, we have area law for this one. Oh, yeah, oh right, right. Because we will see that uh, this constant depends on the temperature, right? So if the temperature is very small, then it becomes meaningless at some point. So we see that this goes like one over temperature. Okay, so then it depends on the model. Yeah. So uh, uh, yes. Yeah, I, I, I want to explain this next lecture in more detail, but basically because in this gapped case, we have yeah, exponential decay of correlation. Okay, this is something that we know, we can prove. So the correlations are very short range in, in these states. And as I said, right, whenever the correlations are short range, the very basic intuition is that uh, this particle should only be correlated with something around here. So this doesn't contribute to the entanglement. So only this kind of correlations contribute to the entanglement. We will see that that's, you know, that's not quite true, but it's what we want to develop. <coughs> yes, as long as it's on a regular lattice in the n dimension. Yes. Sorry? Yes. If t goes to zero, we're here. Yes. Oh, no, 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 okay, so, so the gap is not a property of the state, it's a property of the Hamiltonian, right? So you give the Hamiltonian matrix defining the Hamiltonian, and then you, and this Hamiltonian matrix, you can look at the eigenvalues. This is the lowest eigenvalue, this is the second lowest eigenvalue, and then you make, you know, you compute this difference, and this is the definition of spectral gap. So it's, it, no, no, this is a property only of the Hamiltonian, not of temperature of the states, right? Then you can ask, uh, given that at, at zero temperature, then you expect to be in the ground state, okay? So of course, you know, one thing is this state, the other thing is the gap. But as you see, uh, depending on the gap, the properties of these states, they are very different, if it's gapped or if it's not, okay? And, yeah, that the answer is it? Yes. Yes. Good point, yes, it reduces to the other one, yes. Yes. And uh, but uh, if you do it uh, for a mixed state, yes, which improves also your state. That's right. Uh, why will uh, this? Uh, the, I mean, it should be. I mean, something being true for uh, t equal to zero not being true yeah. for t greater than zero, I can understand. Yeah, that's right. Some yes. Some property holding for higher temperature and suddenly it disappears. Yeah. Yeah, and that's right. And, and, and the issue would be because the area law that we prove for mixed for mixed states for mutual information will be something like this. 
some constant that only depends on the geometry, but divided by temperature, okay? So when temperature goes to zero, this doesn't mean anything, right? That's why you cannot recover. But then it's an interesting question to see, well, for what kind of models this actually implies area law for pure states? And we know something about this. There is some class, some properties that of the spectrum that we can use to infer, but it doesn't work in general. But I, we will get more, we get to that more later. That's correct. So you but, it's, but, but it's bound divergence, right? The problem is here. So you, you are correct. When, when the temperature goes to zero, this guy goes to the entropy of the ground state if it's not degenerate, right? And the amount of entanglement of psi zero. But this goes to infinity, right? But this limit diverges, right? So when t goes to zero, this becomes infinity. So it's saying nothing, right? It's saying that the amount of entanglement is smaller than infinity. So yeah, right? So of course, you can be more careful. You can say, well, maybe we don't choose t to infinity. We just choose t to be you know, a log area and see what you get. Some guys, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So, but let's, let's see this later. That's correct. The question is, I mean, does it work generally for a mixed state? I mean, okay, so in general, no, right? Because as pure states, if you take a generic mixed state, the mutual information will, will scale like a volume of the region, right? But then you can say, well, you, you, you have to put some other properties on the state. One property of the state can be the state is a Gibbs state. That's fine. Another property can be, well, the state has short range correlations, for example. Does this imply area law? And this we don't know for, mi for mixed states. Even in one dimension. This will be one of the open questions that I will tell you. Yes. So what is the critical uh, state and then you have some What is critical? Oh, I mean w w when the gap shrinks. OK? When, 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 when this doesn't hold true. Because, yeah. This, this, this property uh, of the gap shrink is, is an indication that there is a phase transition, like a quantum phase transition. So then the correlation then should divert. That's correct. My time is up. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so how do you actually define the two regions where your x and your x complement? How do you? No, no, no. W one thing is the correlation length of the states, right? So uh, to define the regions, we only need the lattice, the geometry of the lattice, right? So for example, if you are on a line, then uh, you, you define some region x just by saying, well, x is just this region here. This is independent of the states, right? Of course, the correlation length might diverge, but you still have the lattice, and you can still define the region. Uh, all right, so what I would do next is just to state this area law for thermal states that I already stated is that with a temperature, so maybe I write. And maybe this is a good point to stop. So next lecture, I'll just start proving this to you. You see it's a very, very nice proof, very simple, uh, like five lines. And then the rest of the lectures will be trying, to, you know, proving what we know about the pure state case. And then you see it's much more difficult, okay? So, so it's interesting how how, how more difficult the zero temperature case is than the finite temperature case. One thing that I, a warning is that, you know, we define this notion of area law, but we also have to understand if it's useful or not, right? In one dimension for pure states, you see that it's very useful. It's the right thing to do. For mixed states, we have this notion, but we don't know if it's useful for anything. This, we don't know if this implies some good ansatz for the state, for example. So it might be that this is very easy to prove, but it's the, it's the wrong notion of area law. And this is another open question that I want to discuss with you. So, okay, that's all. Thanks.